Over 20 years ago, I was sitting in my grandmother's living room late at night when a new anime premiered on Adult Swim. It was, of course, Yu Yu Hakusho. Man, I wrote that over a year ago and it still feels good. Maybe you remember, maybe you don't, maybe you never saw the video to begin with, which is probably the case. Honestly, that's fine with me because I didn't end up liking that video that much. I was under time constraints, I was super burned out, so here I am, I'm remaking it. Welcome to the bigger, better version. Welcome to the deluxe. Welcome to the uh, burrito supreme version. The director's cut of my first big look into that initial dip of the roller coaster of the series that is Yu Yu Hakusho. I'm gonna be talking about more. I'm gonna be going more in depth and I'm gonna cover all of the manga that wasn't touched in the anime. So let's do that. Today begins the thorough and complete breakdown of one of the greatest shonen battle anime to grace the small screen, Yu Yu Hakusho. And we're gonna start from the start. I wasn't waiting for this premiere, it just came on. But I sat and I watched the entire thing and afterwards I knew all I wanted was more. Watching an entire series on Adult Swim was definitely difficult at the time, but I caught what I could and eventually a more cleaned up version of the show was put on Toonami's afternoon block. And unlike DBZ, which aired during dinner time, which I was forced to sit through, I was more or less able to catch every episode of Yu Yu Hakusho as they came out. Fast forward 20 years to now, and it is probably the series I've watched more than any other, and there is good reason for that. The story of Yusuke Yurameshi is condensed, much more than a typical 200 plus episode shonen. But it's also easy to cut into pieces, vivisected by not only periods in Yusuke's life, but periods within the show. It's a series that goes by fluidly without dragging itself. And sure, the Dark Tournament definitely has some fights that are stretched out here and there, but for the most part, Yu Yu Hakusho takes off running and doesn't stop. It's also a series that transforms as it goes, and there's a lot of reasons for that as well, but if you were to watch episode 1 and then skip to 86, you may think you are watching a totally different show. The same could easily be said about the manga, which I finally read for the first time much earlier this year, and I would have read it a long time ago, but the manga is notoriously hard to find, and to this day, I still only have the first and third Tonkoban. This is also the story of an exceptional young manga artist named Yoshihiro Togashi, who endeared himself to me as I read through the manga for the first time. As I did the historical research for this video, I felt more and more of a connection to him. It was impossible to not see correlations between my and his experience within this industry. While this video is focusing specifically on how and why Yu Yu Hakusho was able to take off because of its very solid foundation, it's also going to be an exploration of Togashi and a reflection on how this video is even reaching you to begin with. This is a story of dreams coming true, but it's also a cautionary tale because even the brightest stars eventually burn out. My name is Mike, this is Bonsai Pop, and these are the salad days of Yu Yu Hakusho. Let's get into it. Before we get started, I want to give you guys a brief news update. We have 22 videos planned for this year. They're already scheduled. When they're coming out, titles, everything. That's a minimum of two videos per month, and every single one of them has been requested by our viewers. Many of them are going to be well over an hour long, and right now I'm recording another video in tandem with this that has already surpassed that. However, between last month and this month, the future of that schedule and production has become uncertain. Getting that much content out costs us money. An hour long video is $900 minimum because we pay editors a fair wage. An hour long video also takes about two weeks to edit. And while we planned on having the money to be able to pay editors, we don't. Sponsors are currently few and far between and our Patreon is about as low as it's ever been. And the fact of the matter is Tyler and I are not able to keep that schedule alone. We need editors because we need to be doing the research, the reading, the writing, and while that's being edited, we need to move on to the next thing. If we cut the production staff down to just Tyler and I, we're talking maybe being able to get out half of those videos, maybe. And if that's the way it's gotta be, that's okay. We're gonna be fine. Will it be a bummer? Sure, it'll be a bummer to us. It'll definitely be a bummer to our editors. And I imagine that it'd be a bummer to you because I'm sure you would like to see more videos come out than less. But the cold hard fact is this is out of our hands. We are doing everything we possibly can, but we can't make money just appear. So if we're gonna thrive and if we can get this schedule out, it's going to be the best year on the channel. 
we need support. And I want to assure you guys that I'm not asking for money. I always encourage people to join the Patreon because we do give a lot back. We have a great community and it's a legitimately fun place to be. But if we don't get the funds, we are going to continue to truck along the absolute best that we can. But for 22 videos to come out this year, we just need investors. So we're gonna try and build up the Patreon again. $3 a month, it supports us, it supports our editors, and it gets more videos out. On top of that, you get watch parties, you get the Discord, you know the deal. The future of Bonsai Pop is in your hands. I know things are tough out there, believe me, it's tough in here too. <laughs> and know that just watching these videos, it, it really is huge. It's, it's, thank you. Hopefully we can make this work. Hopefully this is the best year the channel's ever had. We'll see. Thanks for hearing me out. On with the show. When the first chapter of Yu Yu Hakusho released, Yoshihiro Togashi was just 22 years old. He had one thing on his mind, and that was making a hit manga. He had already won the Tezuka Award, the highest award for new mangaka in Japan, but now he wanted to make his mark. And that was likely his first mistake. 22 is a weird age. You're out of high school, some people are out of college at that point, but there's still a lot of life experience missing. The idea of rising to the top and becoming famous is still bright and shiny and full of naivete. It's also a mindset that really hasn't changed at all. I mean, look where you are. YouTube, the land of young people trying to become superstars, and most will literally do anything to get there. Here's a little something that I've learned through experience. Unless you follow the crowd, the dream of becoming a superstar will not come true. It's why you see so much reiterative content. You see copycats and extremely surface level content reach the trending tab. It's why makeup YouTubers and drama channels will always be more successful than people like H Bomber Guy who make long in-depth videos on various topics. The average consumer wants comfort and stability in their entertainment, they do not want to think or be challenged. YouTube knows this, advertisers know this, and that trickles down onto the rest of us. Those who play the game win, and those more interested in the art of the medium struggle to put food on the table. Now Togashi, for all his genius, was a crowd follower. But let's not forget how important that is in Japan. Conformity is seriously a means of survival in Japanese culture. I mean, even here in America, they say the nail that sticks out gets hammered in. In Japan, the nail that sticks out gets yoinked and thrown in the dumpster. However, by 1990, shonen battle manga had become the penultimate rage, with series like Dragon Ball, Fist of the North Star, and Ranma Half reaching incredible heights on the charts. Togashi wanted a piece of that pie, so he decided to create a shonen battle manga, aka the 90s manga equivalent to makeup YouTubers. That said, it's not a bad thing to follow the crowd sometimes, especially when it comes to business, and if you're getting paid, art is a business. You might be making the best manga in the world, but the fact of the matter is if you haven't had previous success, if you don't have a name out there, it's very likely nobody's ever gonna read it and it's gonna die on the table. If you don't know how to advertise, if you don't know how to entice somebody into your product, it's over. You know, unless some kind of miracle happens, they do. And I do my best on Bonsai Pop to swim up river, right? I, I cover classics. I do this old kind of style, long videos, video essays, if you will, whatever. But I wouldn't be here if we hadn't done Five Nights at Freddy's videos on Treesicle. Hello there. Back then, we had to sacrifice a lot of artistic integrity to get to this point where I'm able to have some. Doing what you have to do so eventually you can do what you want to do. So right from the get-go, his manga Poltergeist Report, Spirit Files, Yu Haka Show, whatever you want to call it, was set up to follow a trend to make a young man rich and famous, and it worked. However, we'll eventually find out what happens when your spirit doesn't really fit into the rocket that you've created for yourself. Now, after two years of publication, Yu Yu Hakusho was greenlit for an anime adaptation by Studio Periot, or Periol, I don't know. Regardless, the studio up until that time hadn't made much of a splash in the West and was only boasting Yurusei Yatsura as its most popular anime, which is nothing to sneeze at, but it had been a decade since they'd had a smash hit. But it would also be almost another decade before they would have another truly beloved show in the West after Yu Yu Hakusho with great teacher Onizuka, which you should definitely watch because we're going to do a video on it and it's one of Steve Bloom's greatest performances. Super good show. And of course, Periot would eventually pick up Bleach and Naruto, making them absolutely legendary. But in 1992, they were simply another studio that had had one major hit in the late 70s, Yu Yu Hakusho 
would turn that around. Speaking of the anime, what immediately caught my attention those 20 long years ago was the opening, which deserves its own video and will probably get one. I have watched the series in both Japanese and English, but obviously my first experience was English, and I absolutely swear by it to this day. Regardless of my personal preferences in that area, this was a time when anime opening songs were occasionally translated, which has completely gone away, a bittersweet fact of our times, because both Smile Bomb, which is the opening track of Yu Yu Hakusho, and Freckles from Moroni Kenshin are absolutely awesome bops. The former is a late 80s city pop jam full of synthesized horns and slap bass and the, the melody is great the lyrics are fun if not a little cheesy but what really punches is the end thank you for waking me up as all the characters fall from the sky and land in a group pose you're instantly hit with color and style Yu Yu Hakusho has the look. It was made smack in the middle of the perfect era of anime that just had this flavor. All hand-drawn, big emphasis on characters. The series has its own look that's hard to describe, but you're looking at it right now, so I'm sure you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. The characters are diverse and recognizable, but also color-coded in this late 80s kind of pastel look. Yusuke is green, Botan is pink, Kuwabara blue, Kurama in magenta, and Hiei in black. And throwing black in there seems like it wouldn't work, but for some reason it just does perfectly. These colors also represent the characters perfectly, but again, that's for another video. Either way, it's a great way to start a show and is a legendary OP. And then of course, the second thing to grab me was the hook of episode one. This is Yusuke Yurameshi and he's dead. That is such an interesting way to start a series. I mean, things have already obviously gone down and where we're going to go from here is anyone's guess. And the rest of the episode is essentially a recap of how Yusuke died while semi-subtly giving the audience a lot of character info. Yusuke himself is a stereotype. He's a young guy with a chip on his shoulder, a delinquent who skips school and flips skirts and gets into fights on a daily basis. He's got slicked back hair, which is essentially the Japanese version of Liberty Spikes or a mohawk, and he's got a nasty attitude. However, there is another side to all of this. Yusuke's dad is completely out of the picture. We never see or hear from him. He and his single mom live alone together in a small apartment. She was 15 when Yusuke was born, which is something pretty taboo in American society, but highly taboo in Japanese society. She doesn't work and spends most of her time sleeping or drinking when she isn't out all night. The money she does get is from extorting police and the Yakuza, but this isn't shown in the anime. So Yusuke spends the majority of his time alone without supervision. He's neglected. And because of this, naturally he puts on a tough guy act to protect himself because nobody's looking out for him, at least in his opinion. And in his defense, there are adults in his life that are legitimately out to get him. Some of the teachers at school want him gone and will go to serious lows in order to make that happen. And while a US audience may see this as a cartoonishly villainous, in Japan, a school's reputation is literally everything. A student like Yusuke makes the whole school look bad. This can result in less funding, which would obviously affect a teacher's salary. Not that what these guys do is right, but it does shed a little light on some of the cultural aspects of why they might be giant dicks. But because of his nasty reputation, kids at school are scared of Yusuke. But more importantly, they're scared to be associated with him. They don't want to be seen by the teachers as a cohort of the worst kid in school, and they don't want to get beat down by the street gangs that want Yusuke's scalp either. The idiom, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down, might as well be the Japanese anthem. So as is socially expected, everyone hammers on Yusuke. Except for Keiko, who is the true queen of the story. Keiko is Yusuke's childhood friend who knows exactly who Yusuke really is and isn't afraid to smack the shit out of him when he needs it. She deeply cares about him and is concerned about his future. She's popular and talented and according to the manga loves cooking and cleaning, which is why you might want to wait to write your opus until you're a little bit older than 22. She naturally chafes Yusuke, but he respects Keiko more than anyone else in his life, despite 
you know, her nagging him. And then there's also Takanaka, who's the principal of the school and comes off as a real hard ass, but he seems to understand Yusuke's difficult life and sympathizes with that. He wants what's best for the young punk, but his standing as an authority figure is in the way of him getting through to a kid who doesn't trust adults and doesn't trust them for good reason. And of course, this is all stuff I only notice later in life. Which I gotta admit is weird. I'm not a young punk anymore, so I have like experience. I've gained perspective and some wisdom, which I'm sure would piss off younger me. That said, I always try to do right by that guy, because honestly, I thought he was a good kid and he had some of the right ideas, you know? But now I can see young me in other people. And it seems like Takanaka got it. It seems like he really understood Yusuke. He could see his potential and how his life was really difficult and kind of was standing up for him. And I definitely had teachers like Takanaka and I wish now that I would have given them more of a chance. But speaking of that young punk, the young me watched this and saw a kid taking his life into his own hands. I related to Yusuke more than any other character I'd seen in a TV show up to that point. I was also having a really difficult time at home. Things were chaotic, extremely turbulent. I hated being there more than anything. I got in trouble at school a lot because it was where I felt that I could be free. I got kicked out of math so many times I still don't know how to divide without a calculator. After school, I'd get bullied at the skate park occasionally and I even got into some pretty serious fistfights. In a lot of ways, Yusuke was me, just uh, without a dad that'd beat his ass if he got caught skipping school. But it wasn't just the kids and the teachers who had given up on Yusuke, it seems like he was set on a certain path for his afterlife already as well. That was until he unexpectedly saved a little boy from getting hit by a car, sacrificing his own life in the process. Yusuke had been having a terrible day. He had actually decided to go to school. He gets in trouble for something he didn't do. He gets kicked out of school. He goes home. His mom gives him crap. Then he tries to make this kid laugh and the kid gets him hit by a car. And that is when the beautiful, very blunt Botan shows up. And all of a sudden you have a contrasting set of characters to easily get you through the beginning. Botan for the record is the Grim Reaper or Shinigami a messenger from the spirit world who guides the souls of the departed over the river Styx or the Sanzu, more on the cultural stuff in a future video, to be judged, of course, by King Yama. Yenma, Enma, whatever you want to call him. Her character design is one of my favorites in 90s anime. Big blue ponytail, big eyes, and a pink kimono, riding an oar like a witch's broom, but side saddled for style, of course. She's awesome. But I do want to pull back for a sec and talk about some real stuff. What I've seen through my experiences is a couple standard personality types. There are people that go with the flow, right? They follow steps A to Z and live just fine without ever making a splash. These people are important. They make the world go round. They're boring but we need them. Then there's people who are truly messed up, sadistic, psychopathic, manipulative, whatever you want to call it. They are really just out to hurt people and that's it. And then there's use case. Your meshi more than anything is hurting, right? Life has been unfair and yes, he takes it out on others, but more than anything, he takes it out on himself. There's really two ways a use K can go, right? You either have redemption or you find them strung out in a gutter clutching some Narcan. A use K can easily go down the road of cruelty and each of these three social templates can obviously vary in intelligence and motive, etc, etc, but the psychopaths and the use Ks kind of battle it out while the go for the flow crowd keeps their heads down in their cubicles and, you know, make sure there's the, the economy doesn't collapse. And whether this was something Togashi-san really understood or stumbled into out of pure luck, he highlights it perfectly through some story contrivances because Yusuke gets another chance. You gotta understand, up until now, he had been seen as a waste, a punk, a, a bad guy, and he died, and when you die in that situation, that's what you leave behind. But now, he can redeem himself. Now that I've reached a point in my life where my brain is all done growing, and I'm mostly self-sustaining, it's really wild to look at the things that younger people can come up with. Again, Togashi was like 22 when this came out. I'm always left wondering what was done on purpose, or what just comes out through their expression because of osmosis. For instance, I don't know anything really technical about music. I don't know the difference between like an A7 and an A major 7, except for the way that they sound. But I can make songs with either one of those chords because I understand what sounds good 
with other things. I know that A notes generally sound good with D notes and G notes. And there's a really impressive amount of wisdom that is woven throughout Yu Yu Hakusho for it being written by such a young guy, especially regarding the themes of redemption. And that's something important to remember and consider. People can do bad things, but that doesn't always make them bad people. I'm not gonna lie, a couple of times I got assaulted after school, I totally deserved it. Yusuke himself has definitely sent some goons to the hospital, but on the inside, he cares about other people, enough to risk his life to save a kid. It's a lot easier for people in pain to put up a front because caring makes you vulnerable. It's the caring in the first place that makes you hurt. And despite the ground floor desire to become rich and famous, Togashi cared about what he was putting out into the world as much as a young man can. Picking up the early volumes of the manga, that becomes immediately evident. Yu Yu Hakusho is beautiful. Togashi is a talented man. His ability with screen tone is excellent. He was able to bring the manga to life in a way that was both as beautiful and as ugly as it needed to be. Each panel feels intentional, whether it's a piece of comedy or a dramatic portrait. The conveyance of visceral emotion seemed to come flawlessly from his work. The style I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the OP, it isn't an anime only thing either. Of course there's more dimorphism in the manga for comedy, but one of the things that makes Yu Hakusho special is how the characters look and feel. Most importantly, they look and feel and act like real people. Obviously they have standard outfits which are mostly school uniforms, but each character changes outfits and styles on a pretty regular basis. They aren't static cutout characters. This takes a ton of effort. I mean imagine if Naruto was constantly changing what he was wearing rather than his typical shinobi attire. I can't even imagine how much extra work it would be to design these clothes, let alone illustrate them continuously and then change it up. It was also obvious in these early days that Togashi himself was full of confidence. In the beginning of the Takuman volumes, he would talk about, you know, what he would be if he had another life. Comedically, but also probably half seriously talking about all the things he would do, being a movie star, and who he would marry, and everything like that. He really was exuding the attitude of youthful success. Enough of that rant though, let's get back to it, right? Uncharacteristically, or perhaps unexpectedly, the first thing that Yusuke asks Botan is whether or not the kid he tried to save is okay and upon hearing he's just a little scraped up, the young man is satisfied to just walk into the light, only to walk into a comedic brick wall. First of all, he can't go to the afterlife because there's no room. He wasn't supposed to die, like he wasn't on schedule or something, and they don't have anywhere to put him. Then, to add insult to injury, Botan reveals that if Yusuke hadn't intervened, the young boy would have miraculously come away without a scratch. So basically, Yusuke made it worse and then died on top of it. He's been having a really bad day. And this would be enough to drive a typical person to drink, but for Yusuke, who's constantly getting knocked around by life, you gotta imagine how bad that's gotta sting. But because of all of this, he's being offered another chance at life, which he immediately refuses. And I think that impact of refusal to come back to life often gets overshadowed by what comes next. But think about it, I mean, here's a kid, right? He's 14 years old and he just died and he would rather not come back to life. He's just floating around in limbo and is offered a chance to come back from the dead and he just refuses it. This is not the response of a selfish punk. This is the response of someone who is feeling completely defeated. At 14 years old, Yusuke Yurameshi is completely blackpilled. He's so nihilistic about his own existence, he would rather just be dead. And through that, it shows how these negative interactions throughout his day-to-day -day life actually affect him. Despite his outward projection of like apathy and aggressiveness, he's in a lot of pain. So in order to maybe get him to change his mind, Botan and Yusuke attend Yusuke's wake. Now of course this is a tried and true story device going back as far as like Tom Sawyer and likely farther, I, but I think there's a sick part of all of us that did narcissistically like to attend our own funeral. And I think to some degree that's because we all feel underappreciated, mostly because communicating is hard. Nobody expects anyone to suddenly die out of the blue, so we do tend to take each other for granted. We don't tell each other how we really feel. A funeral is a raw and visceral experience where people break down over the loss of someone in their life, and I think we'd all like to know how people really feel about us. Yusuke, however, is pretty unenthusiastic about it. He's convinced that nobody would care about him being gone, that he is just a burden and the world's better off without him. Part of him expects people to be maybe even celebrating his demise. 
eyes. And as if to confirm his feelings, the nasty teachers are happy the thorn in their sides is gone. However, that's when Takanaka comes in and shames them for their very disrespectful behavior. As the principal bows his head at Yusuke's wake, he reveals that he's impressed at the kid's selfless action, but can't praise him for it. Takanaka, the man, wishes that Yusuke was still alive. In a scene that's much better done in the anime, Kuwabara, a local punk who's caught Yusuke's fist more than anyone else, busts into the funeral screaming at the casket that Yusuke can't be dead, that he's gotta come back to fight one more time. Despite how other characters in the scene take Kuwabara's actions, this comes off as a very sad moment in the show. It's obvious that Kuwabara has a lot of feelings for Yusuke, even though they're, they may be a little displaced. But to a degree, he defines himself by his interactions with Yusuke and the loss of that person in his life, whether they liked each other or not, is huge until he's dragged away by his friends. And naturally, Keiko and Atsuko are complete wrecks. And then the little boy and his mom show up. Innocently, the boy asks his mom if he can play with Yusuke again when he wakes up, which causes his mom to break down. And this is episode one. It's such a major gut punch, a real you never know what you got till it's gone slap in the face for pretty much every character in the show. It may be one of the best intro episodes of all time. It's a huge showcase of three lovable main characters, as well as the emotional reach of a series that will continue to pull at your heartstrings while also making you laugh along the way. It's also decidedly not very shonen battle anime. Now in the next episode, we find Yusuke whisked away to the spirit world for the first time to meet Koenma, King Yama's son, who has been left in charge while Yama's away doing whatever the Lord of the Underworld does. This place is a crazy hive of overworked ogres and paperwork. Yusuke comments that it looks more like a stock exchange than the afterlife. And in another comedic display, the mighty Koenma takes the form of a three-year-old with a pacifier and has a mildly sadistic personality. He offers Yusuke a spirit egg that'll feed off of his energy and bring him back to life after it hatches depending on the actual actions Yusuke takes during his gestation, the creature that hatches from it will either eat him or help him. And this is where the manga and the anime split off. The show was released in late 1992, two years and roughly 80 chapters into the manga. That would land the manga right around the middle of the dark tournament at the time of the anime's release, which in all honesty was really the perfect point to start the anime for sales purposes. However, this allowed the anime to clean up the beginning of the series a bit. In four episodes, Yusuke is back to life and ready to move on to his career as a spirit detective. But Yusuke is dead for the first two volumes of the manga and doesn't have his first day back in a solid body until chapter 18. These early chapters are full of short stories where Yusuke helps people with supernatural issues. He helps a boy and a tanuki and a boxer and it's, it's really weird. But most of the stories are really good. However, I think I would have fallen off if I had been reading this weekly back in the early 90s. Assuming a chapter was coming out every week, which was Tagashi's schedule, 18 weeks is a long time to wait for some real story development, no matter how good the first two chapters of something are. Though I will say that they give you extra time to learn about Keiko and Kuwabara, the latter of which took me a real long time to get used to in the anime. So let's talk about those early manga chapters because before I wasn't able to do it, but now I can. And I think it's really interesting to see how the manga started versus how the anime chose to do it. And I know that most of you probably have not read Yu Yu Hakusho and that's fine. I'm not a manga elitist and honestly, I prefer the anime. But if we're gonna cover everything, we should cover everything. and. This should be interesting for people who never even knew that there was a bunch of stuff cut from the anime. So in chapter three of the manga, you get uh, one of the anime episodes. It's the one where Yusuke takes over Kuwabara's body to go and talk to Keiko for a minute. We all know how that goes. It's chapter four where the manga spins off. So this chapter is based around a wimpy kid who loves his old dog. And unfortunately, Doggo is on his last legs. And after a bad day at school, the kid comes home to find out that his dog is dead. Unfortunately, the dog's spirit won't leave the house because he's so loyal to the boy. And all these chapters are going to be very spirit detective 
Ziggy, more, more spirit detective than the show ever was. And a lot of them are going to deal with themes of death and grief and moving on. So as spirit detective, Yusuke enters the kid's dream and scares him by telling him that he's going to bring his dead dog to hell. And this is a very Yusuke way to get the kid to stand up for himself and take action to protect his dog. And after the ordeal, he's able to commit to being a stronger person so we won't let down the memory of his best friend Doge. And afterwards, he's able to stand up to his bullies. Chapter 5 is a Christmas story revolving around the ghost of a girl waiting for the boy she loved. And turns out that guy was a creep and a jerk, so Yusuke takes her out on a ghost date and she's able to pass on. Then Yusuke goes and terrorizes the guy who stood her up because he's Yusuke. Next, we have a story about a mean old man who's going to die soon. And it turns out that he's mean because his entire family died in a car accident. He particularly misses his grandson who was very young when he died. Yusuke and Botan meet a tanuki that the old man and his grandson saved when they went into the woods one day. And the tanuki wants to help the old man transition peacefully into death. So he takes the shape of his grandson and visits the old man for the next five nights until he finally passes away. It's actually very touching and it shows Yusuke that a lot of people who are nasty on the outside are just hurting on the inside. And chapter seven is in the anime. This is when Kuwabara can't fight or else his friend is going to lose his job and his family won't be able to afford food. And this of course is an ultimatum forced on him by a particularly nasty teacher. And Yusuke helps him through this whole ordeal despite the teacher doing everything to sabotage Kuwabara. We, we all know how that one went. But the next story is actually pretty good. Yusuke gets a day back in his body and his mom being who she is has taken off for a week and left Yusuke's body under Keiko's care, of course, without even asking her. So Yusuke gets in there and takes off to go gamble and smoke and kick some ass. Meanwhile, Keiko is having trouble with bullies, but is holding her own. And I think that's one of the best things about Keiko as a character is that she's never really a damsel in distress. She does get in over her head occasionally, but honestly, she's an ass kicker. But between her and all of the other female leads in this series, Series, it's obvious that Tagashi really likes strong female characters. So after beating down some bullies, she eventually does get kidnapped by the group of thugs and they actually knock her out cold. It's kind of it's kind of harsh. But of course, Yusuke shows up, lays on the beat down, and the whole story is used to highlight the strong feelings that Yusuke has for Keiko. Also, Kuwabara showed up to save Keiko too, but he was too late. And he actually runs into Yusuke, so now he knows that his rival isn't like totally dead, just kind of dead. Chapter 10 returns to the boy who lost his dog. Turns out all the dealings with Yusuke and the spirit of his dog may have opened up his spirit awareness because he can now see this ghost girl and the little ghost girl has a crush on him but unfortunately she is pulling Shota's spirit that's the boy out of his body while he sleeps to play with him and that's bad for you so now Shota is slowly dying of course you get a sad backstory of the girl who grew up very sick and neglected by her parents and when she died her spirit stuck around because she always wanted to play with other kids and never got the chance when Yusuke goes to stop her from accidentally killing Shota she kicks Yusuke's ass but then she stops being lonely thanks to Shota and she loses her strength because ghosts are powered by their emotions and then Yusuke spanks her for being a brat but just the attention from being scolded makes her want to spend time with Yusuke and get piggybacks so now he's stuck with her. That's how neglected she was and Shota meets a girl and gets a happy ending so that's cool. Now the ghost girl who's named Sayaka is a temporary member of Botan Yusuke crew and in the next chapter she gets a premonition that this girl is going to die so the team follow that girl around and find out she's being haunted by the spirit of of a kid who killed himself. However, the spirit was summoned by some other girl rather than being another ghost refusing to move on. And it turns out the spirit's anger was healed by the girl he's being forced to haunt and that the girl who cursed her is actually her best friend. Then her best friend feels bad about it, so it's all good until it's not. Because in chapter 12, we found out that Aerie is still cursed. She was one of the cursed. And now the curse mark has been burned into the arm of her best friend who cursed her. And the curse has taken on a life of its own, which is a very Japanese concept, you know, focused hate and malice can manifest itself and take revenge on a person or others it comes into contact with, like the grudge, see Jujutsu Kaisen. Eventually the curse is dispelled when Katsumi, the best friend, acknowledges her jealousy and the rivalry she made up in her head, which was a competition reinforced by the school trying to make itself look better by having top tier students at the expense of their happiness. So just in case you forgot, the little spirit girl is still around and the next story involves her dealing with her crush on Yusuke and his feelings for Keiko and Keiko's feelings for him. 
Feelings all around. So Sayaka wants to get to know Keiko to figure out if she's good enough for Yusuke. And again, all of this is being done to reinforce the bonds between the main core characters, Kuwabara, Keiko, Botan, Yusuke. And this story actually leads into the part in the anime where the arsonist tries to burn down Yusuke's house with him inside it, Keiko runs in to rescue him. But in the manga, Keiko rushing into the fire to save Yusuke proves to Sayaka that Keiko is good enough and then Sayaka is able to move on. However, Yusuke coming back to life on scheduled in order to save Keiko cost him all the virtue he's accrued up to this point by doing all the good stuff I just spent 10 minutes explaining. So now Yusuke is back to square one, but he says it was all worth it to save Keiko, which is very sweet. Also, Kuwabara was there at the end of the fire scene, and in the manga he takes Keiko home so his sister can give her a haircut and give her some spare clothes. In this way, we meet Shizuru early in the manga. And the final story is a couple chapters long, and then the anime comes back in, and this one is about a boxer who Yusuke grew up with and they were friends when they were young. There's also some important exposition from Koenma. So while Yusuke is out trying to help the boxer, Koenma explains to Botan that the underworld is going to give Yusuke's body back anyway. He says that he was able to analyze Yusuke's soul through the virtue, and he says that Yusuke exhibits immorality and decency at the same time, that he's haphazard but haphazardly consistent. So he needs to return to his body in order to be judged because he's literally an idiot and without a body, his nature lacks definition. Meanwhile, Yusuke is getting frustrated with Suikichi because he keeps getting bullied but won't fight in any other way than boxing. He thinks street brawling is stupid and unsportsmanly and Yusuke keeps taking over his body in order to fight which is driving Suikichi insane. That said, despite being super strong, Suikichi keeps getting his butt kicked because the other guys aren't playing fair and he's also scared because he's been abused so much. This results in constant losses in the ring. So naturally Yusuke gets him into the worst position possible and then forces him to face his fears and in doing so, Yusuke finally gets ejected from his body, yeah, because Yusuke was like stuck in his body, and Suikichi wins his match fair and square against the toughest boxer around, and now we're back in the anime. I think the anime taking some liberty with the beginning of the series was a really smart idea. I also think this discrepancy between the two versions of the story is telling of where Togashi was early in. Poltergeist Report or Spirit Files isn't exactly an evocative name for a manga. It's kind of on the nose, or, you know, at least it invokes an idea of what the story is going to be. I mean, what does Poltergeist Report make you envision? Think about it. It's probably not the Dark Tournament. This makes me think that Tagashi didn't really know what he wanted to do with his manga, or at least he didn't know how to get from point A to point B smoothly. He wanted a shonen battle manga, but he started it off as an emotional comedy, which then turned into a baddie of the week rag with an underlying goal of Yusuke coming back to life. However, there was wasn't a lot of fighting, there wasn't a lot of growth, it was just kind of, you know, it, it was more what you would expect from Poltergeist Report. This went on for almost five months, and even then, Yusuke coming back to life was super ham-fisted, right? He was supposed to get this egg, you know, to hatch and all this stuff, but instead, Kwema just shows up one day and is like, okay, you can come back to life today because it turns out your spiritual wavelengths are longer than the average Joe Schmo, and if you don't do it today, you gotta wait 50 years. So I guess we're just gonna forget the whole egg thing and you know, the test of use case soul, whatever. Like I said, it's ham fisted and that's going to be a plot style uh, it's gonna come up quite a bit. But honestly, just because something's ham-fisted here and there, it doesn't mean that it's like a glaring problem, right? It's nothing that ruins the series or makes it bad. There's just a lot of stuff that's thrown out or in really quickly. You'll see what I'm talking about. As far as Yusuke just being able to come back to life, I don't really care how it happens, right? I just want to get out of the Yusuke being dead part. And this is where that objectivity versus subjectivity issue comes in. It's been so long since the first time I saw this anime that I don't remember how I felt about the early episodes back in the day. But I know when I watch it now, by episode four, I'm sick of Yusuke being dead and I just want to move on with the story. And I know now having read the manga three times, the first 18 chapters go by pretty slowly. Obviously the first time reading them through they were more interesting because I hadn't seen them before. So after Yusuke comes back to life, he's more or less immediately conscripted to become a spirit detective, essentially the intermediary between the living world and the threats to it from the demonic plane. And at first, he's given a few gadgets, right? Like a comic detective would have, you know, a spirit detecting compass, a looking glass that can see through stuff. But again, uh, this all just kind of gets thrown out the window and basically is never mentioned again uh, within a few chapters. This is also the time that the spirit 
or ray gun is introduced, which is arguably one of the coolest signature move in anime, and I don't know why. It's like if the Fonz shot a Kamehameha every time he said, hey. Something about simply being able to point and shoot with a classic, you know, finger gun pose, it's like the dream of every kid. It has a real use the force level kind of effect to it. It's a stroke of genius that would become as iconic as a Kamehameha itself. I mean, you may not know Yu Yu Hakusho, but you definitely know the spirit gun if you like anime. And this is also about the same time that Kurama and Hiei are introduced, but as villains, and the series begins to kind of take shape, though not instantaneously. The two demons originally appear as part of a trio that stole weapons from under Koenma's nose in order to sow chaos in the living world. After escaping the spirit world, Kurama, having his own plans, dips out on the other two in the group. The biggest and most psychopathic member of the trio, Goki, likes to eat the souls of little kids, which honestly, is pretty dark. This makes him arguably the first kind of big bad that Yusuke is put up against and starts the trend of the spirit detective winning his bouts with sheer dumb luck. Again, I'm not sure if this was purposeful or if Tagashi was still having issues going from point A to point B. But after Goki is put down, Kurama takes center stage, and rather than a fight, Yusuke actually helps him save his mother from a terminal illness using essentially a monkey's paw. Once again, achieving this only happens through dumb luck. But we learn that Kurama is a fox demon living in a human's body that he stole in utero. However, instead of taking off when he was big enough to fend for himself, he ended up loving and appreciating his mother, which makes him, at this point, the most interesting character in the series. I think this is an understated part in the development of Yusuke, especially in the anime. Right, because in the manga we get a lot more time with Yusuke before Kurama really comes into the picture. However, saving Kurama's mother with the mirror that grants wishes is a huge reveal. So while the mirror is promised to fulfill any wish, it also takes the life force of its user to fulfill that wish. So essentially it kills you if, if you make a wish. Not sure what happens if you wish to never die, but I guess we're never going to know. So Kurama is going to sacrifice himself for his mother, which shows exactly how much he loves her, which I think means more the longer you get to know Kurama because he's such a badass demon. But Yusuke is inherently moved by this and jumps in to save Kurama, sacrificing half of his entire life, which of course is never brought up again, so it's not a big deal. But the point is, is that Yusuke does this without thinking. He was not planning to sacrifice half of his life to help somebody he doesn't even really know save another person he doesn't even really know. No matter how nasty he is on the outside, he can't help but begrudgingly do the right thing when it matters. And then we got Hiei, who initially comes off as like a Vegeta stand-in, right? He's short, he's got cone hair, and he's nasty. And while getting the hoodoo voodoo zombie making sword back from him comes down to a fight, Yusuke again wins by dumb luck, shooting his spirit gun at a mirror, hoping it bounces off like a laser, which it does, and then it hits the overconfident height challenged TA in the back. Having solved his first major problem, the story decides to move into an important transition of making Yusuke stronger. Up until this point, he'd made it through, again, with dumb luck and contrivance. And don't get me wrong, the spirit gun is super cool, but there was no fanfare to Yusuke learning it. Koenma just pops in and is like, hey, you can do this thing, and Yusuke just does it. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense, considering what we learn in this next segment of the story. But I'd like to pause again to compare the manga and the anime when it comes to some content. Yu Yu Hakusho is a little more edgy than Dragon Ball, which makes sense, and that's why it originally aired on Adult Swim. Goku is innocent. Anything raunchy that happens in that series is usually a comedic joke about Goku being an idiot. This series has comparatively little to no raunch, but the subject matter is a little more adult. The anime, for instance, is full of cursing, and there's quite a bit of smoking and drinking from older members of the cast. However, the manga has little to no swearing. In fact, you'll see things like Kuwabara saying, holy spit, you know what I mean? It's, it's like they deliberately go out of the way to censor that stuff out. But in that version, Yusuke is a smoker and a gambler. There's also a few instances of kids getting drunk, and none of that is in the anime. 
Anyway, moving on, we find Yusuke getting bribed into his next mission by Botan, who offers him tickets to a fight in the Tokyo Dome if he roots out a demon named Rando from a selection process being held by the legendary medium and martial artist Genkai. Now, I'd argue this is where the series takes hold and gets some solid footing. It also expands on Kuwabara's character, which was really needed in the anime by this point, and in the dub, he's played by the legendary Christopher Sabat of Vegeta and Piccolo fame, but I think this may be his best role once you get over how butt ugly Kuwabara is. Also, fun little side note here about Kuwabara's hair. Apparently in Japanese culture, it's very edgy to dye your hair blonde, but I don't know if you've ever bleached your hair, but believe me, it, it's a pain in the ass. And if you have thick, dark hair, it's more difficult to dye it blonde, obviously. But if you do it wrong, essentially what happens is your hair comes out really orange and really brassy and it's gross. That's what happened to Kuwabara. That's why Kuwabara has red hair. And Kuwabara, the whole joke about Kuwabara is that he's ugly and he's broke. So that hair is supposed to reinforce that not understanding about what he looks like, not caring, and him just being ugly and goofy. Instead of his typical uber masculine characters, Kuwabara is a lot more goofy and kind of stupid, which Sabat emphasizes with a really slight inflection of a surfer dude. It seems my power to see ghosts and spooky stuff has gone up greatly in the past few weeks and it's getting to where I can't even concentrate on my fighting, you know? It's a really fun voiceover and one that I, I definitely appreciate a lot. It turns out that Kuwabara has shown up at the perfect time to get sucked into the selection even though he was only attempting to seek Genkai's help. It's not explained as well in the anime, but Kuwabara's family is gifted with a particularly sensitive sixth sense and since Yusuke's days of being a ghost in communicating with and even possessing Kuwabara, the guy's lost control of it and has been dealing with being haunted. Of course, that's all forgotten when competition between himself and Yusuke is thrown into the mix. And I really want to take a second to highlight Genkai because I feel like she doesn't get enough love. First of all, it is super seldom that a woman, let alone an extremely diminutive old lady, is the master martial artist in a shonen battle manga. Not only that, but she isn't subservient in any way. Instead, she is rougher, gruffer, and meaner than anybody else. She's a smoker and a drinker with a dirty mouth and she loves video games. In other words, she's kind of the best. She's also the creator of the spirit wave, which is arguably the most powerful technique ever wielded by a human. And it's this power which Rando is after, and also that she is bequeathing to the winner of her selection process. Though I have to say, it's the second of the four tests that's the most interesting. Yusuke and the rest of the contestants have to participate in three games which measure their individual power levels. You get a punching machine for spirit strength, rock, paper, scissors for spirit awareness, and a karaoke game that shows how much room you have to grow spiritually. Now, Kuwabara's scores make sense and work that way for the rest of the manga. His awareness is super high, his strength is pretty high, but his room to grow is middling. And if you've seen the entire of the series, you know that that's like that's cool bar in a nutshell. Yusuke, on the other hand, has basically no awareness, a ton of strength, but his room to grow is just average. A little higher than Kuwabara and that's it. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind moving forward because this is the only time we get any power level measurements. And it's common knowledge within this community, power levels are one of the most difficult things to get down in a shonen battle manga. It's also something that Togashi would master with his later work Hunter x Hunter, and through that it would be transferred over to Jujutsu Kaisen much later on. However, this was the era of Super Saiyan 3 and world destroying energy blasts, people really hadn't figured out how to mitigate overpoweredness in a way that was engrossing yet. Regardless, the selection process eventually boils down, of course, to a martial arts tournament, the most important touchstone of a shonen battle manga. It's also the revelation that Yu Yu Hakusho is a shonen battle manga. It's important to remember that up until this point, the series hadn't completely defined itself, and while we're only 10 episodes into the anime, which is still pretty far, we're 27 chapters into the manga. That's 27 weeks without the series having the shonen battle kind of standard. That's four Tonkoban in. This is 
also clearly where the series begins to take off in the public eye. But naturally, Rando in disguise makes it to the finals and absolutely brutalizes Kuwabara. Even to this day, it's hard to watch. He breaks both his legs, one of his arms, and almost all his ribs using a shrinking magic that he stole from a medium he killed. It was just kind of his thing. At this point, he's murdered 99 psychics and plans on making Genkai his 100th, assuming he can beat Yusuke, which he doesn't, again, by pure happenstance. While this fight solidifies Yusuke's ability to do that typical, you know, I found untapped power within myself when I got pushed too far thing, once again he's saved only because a puddle he fell in happened to be connected underground to a different one. It's another example of dumb luck. And then to add on to that, the only reason he actually beats Rando is because he gets pond slime in his ears, and it just so happens that when you can't hear the secret shrinking technique, it backfires on the user. Yusuke wins, Kuwabara heals, and the day is saved. However, instead of going to the Tokyo Dome, Yusuke gets stuck with Genkai kicking his ass for weeks. And this training is never shown in its entirety, it's kind of uh, talked about here and there in, in flashbacks, but unlike Dragon Ball where you get this very long arc on Master Roshi's Island, Yusuke in the next episode, and again even in the manga, is just totally skipped over. Which honestly I kind of like, I mean, you know, why do we have to see all the training? Just punching and kicking and doing stuff. It keeps the show in a steady flow. Almost immediately upon his return, Yusuke is conscripted again to deal with a threat to the human world. After running into some demon bug infested humans, Yusuke and Kuwabara, who have gotten closer through the whole, you know, Genkai ordeal, find themselves headed to the demon world to take down the four legendary saint beasts in my least favorite arc of this series. And I don't know if that's controversial or not, but there's something about this section that feels uninteresting or uh, boring. I don't know, dragged out. There's something about it. And it's an issue that isn't in the manga. So my guess is that the studio wanted to give the manga room to push out a few more chapters before they, you know, accidentally caught up or whatever. Because Interestingly, there's really no filler in Yu Yu Hakusho, but there are points where battles get dragged out a little bit longer than they need to be. It's nothing compared to any of the big three, but I personally feel like this arc suffered for it. But this is also a turning point for the manga and for Togashi. In the Takaban, we start to see some art from other mangaka congratulating Togashi, some being like, wow, this is turning into a shonen battle manga. It's also the first time all four of the series' heroes come together allowing a group dynamic to take shape and specifically for Hiei and Yusuke to squash some beef. Instead of being incarcerated for their crimes, both Hiei and Kurama have been put on community service from the spirit world and get tasked with backing up Yusuke in his fight against the Saint Beast. Immediately, Hiei's loyalties are put to the test when he gets a chance to save himself at the deaths of his companions. However, he comes through and everyone makes it out of the trap alive. That being said, him and Kuwabara are always at odds having incompatible personal personality types. The characters playing off each other is fun and it's well done, but their enemies in this part are kind of uninspired and Byako the White Tiger outstays his welcome in particular. We do get to see how Kuwabara has improved, no longer needing a broken practice sword to manifest his own spirit sword, and Hiei's fight with Seiryu, the blue dragon, is particularly cool, mostly because it's like what a real fight would be, you know? You just start it and it's over. But I gotta say that Yusuke is lucky he didn't piss off Hiei as bad as that guy did. Uh, because I, I don't think Yusuke would have made it out of his first fight. Anyway, the whole plot comes down to Yusuke fighting the big bad, while in the human world, Keiko is being targeted by said castle boss, Suzaku. Now, Suzaku has a cool character design, right? Like, his whole thing is lightning, and while I tend to skip this arc, I really do enjoy this last battle. The demon insects I mentioned earlier are controlled by this metal-ass flute that Suzaku has, and he's set these possessed humans on Keiko and ostensibly Botan in a real Dawn of the Dead homage. It's super duper neat. The idea is to murder Keiko on screen in front of Yusuke to make him real sad before Suzuku kills him too. Naturally, this doesn't work out or the series would be really short, but there's a real sense of tension that comes with this fight because you know Keiko is fighting for her life as well. And the art in the manga is particularly good here. You could really tell that Togashi understood how important pulling this off was going to be for the future of a series. I gotta say though, while revisiting this arc, even though it's 
kind of my least favorite. Doesn't mean that it's bad. I mean, the show is so good, even your least favorite part is still going to be good. I particularly like that last battle I mentioned, and it's movie homage, obviously. But this also seems to be the point where Studio Perio, like, really upped their game. We start getting to see the fidelity that we're going to be getting consistently throughout the Dark Tournament and the rest of the series. The look and the style of the show begins to mold into its eventual top tier status, and some of the outfits, I mean, especially Botan's outfit, that is classic. It would probably be my favorite one on her. Also, the action is much better choreographed than it had been before. As far as the manga process went, well, unfortunately, it was having negative effects on the man himself. If you remember earlier in the video, I talked about the blurbs from Tagashi within the Tonkaban volumes. For the entirety of the series up until around this point, he seems full of energy and confidence. But in this volume, he takes a sudden turn. Out of the blue, he's extremely tired and self-conscious. He talks about going to a cafe and seeing some schoolgirls before he notices that he's covered in tobacco stains and has screen tones stuck to his butt. He's embarrassed and envious of their freedom and their youth, which is kind of a weird thing for a 23-year-old guy to say. He notes later in the volume how much work he does. Five days a week on art, two days for story. He sleeps only five hours a night. That means he works all day, every day. And then he begins complaining about back pain. I find it unfortunately ironic that these symptoms begin to set in as he begins to get his story on track to where he was aiming for it to be all along. And take it from someone who has lived this life, okay? It catches up with you. I started YouTube when I was 24. I was in college and working full time. I had also never edited anything in my life, so I was learning as I went. However, the process was one of the most exciting things I had ever done, right? I was making little TV shows all on my own. I was not sleeping though. I was chain smoking cigarettes and living off coffee. Eventually I got a job with Tree School and began editing full time. Each video I tried to outdo myself. I loved making them and I was getting really good at it. We were also completely dependent on YouTube revenue doled out four different ways, so we were forced to grind out two to three videos a week. It got to the point where I was writing and editing for sometimes up to 60, 80 hours a week. I did this until a year and a half into Bonsai Pop, at least two years after my body had told me that it had had enough. Because when I was 28, I began having panic attacks that were sending me to the hospital on almost a weekly basis, but I kept going and going. I started to get carpal tunnel. Uh, my back started to get messed up, but I kept going and going. Half out of a need to support myself and, you know, my friends, and but also half out of a love for what I do. And of course, because YouTube doesn't give you any option to stop or take breaks. It's funny. So a year after I originally wrote this video, uh, I broke down. In October of 2023, I just all of a sudden, like, I couldn't work anymore. After we put out the two plus hour Kenshin video, uh, we had another big video planned and I just, like I said, I broke down. I honestly didn't know if I was going to come back to the channel. The thought of quitting and throwing it all away was in my head it, it, for the first time ever. It, it was, I was seriously contemplating it. I spent the rest of that year in bed pretty much. I just, I like, I couldn't get out of bed. I was so tired, just completely tired. I mean, I have been watching, playing, reading, and writing, watching, playing, reading, and writing, and then editing and editing and editing and editing for the better part of a decade, eight years, nine years at this point every single week, wringing every little thing I possibly could out of my brain to get on paper and just sitting in this chair. And I know, I know, it's a, it's a trend now that people are making fun of YouTubers for them saying that their job is hard. And I get it, I used to look at my heroes on YouTube and I'd be like, man, they just get to like play video games and get in front of a car like camera and talk about it and everybody loves them and that's just the life. And honestly, like, this job is amazing. It's so cool. And I'm so lucky to be in this position. And I'm thankful. Thank you, guys. Thank you. But everything has its downsides. You know, work is work. And this is the entertainment industry. There is a, a lot of pressure. And it's just me and Ty. We're just two guys. Guys, you probably wouldn't even notice if we were in the same restaurant. But yeah, like I said, work is work. And 
Making videos is hard work. <laughs> Making successful videos is even harder. Likewise, in the manga world, you have deadlines. If you fail to meet them, you can get canceled and you may never find work again. It is a brutal, isolating lifestyle. One thing I can say is that I'm lucky we have nice chairs in 2022. It's 2024 now. You may be wondering about Togashi's back pain, right? A lot of that is going to come from being hunched over an artboard day in and day out, but the rest, I'm gonna say maybe even the majority of it is from tension. One of the things that people tend not to take into consideration when looking at a job like mangaka is the litany of things they have to juggle, right? You aren't given an assignment other than make a chapter of manga by X date. What's in the chapter, how it looks, and getting it done on time is essentially up to you. Yes, you are going to have an editor, but honestly, the editor is just going to make your life difficult by forcing you to make changes. This means that if what you've created is bad, it's more or less all your fault. You need to think about how this next chapter fits into your story, how it not only builds the narrative and the characters, but also how audiences are going to react to it and how that's going to affect things moving forward. If this chapter is bad, then you might lose readers. If you continue to lose readers, you might lose your manga. If you lose your manga, you might lose your career. You have very little time and how much work you have is dependent on how much you care about what you're doing. And most artists care a lot. You can cut corners, but what's going to come out is a manga that isn't as good as you want it to look. Nobody wants to put out something subpar, so add in the overachieving and self-doubt too. Overextension, hyperfixation, and doing it every week forever. When a manga is doing well, a publisher doesn't want that manga to end. So as long as it's doing well, it will continue. The problem is, is creativity isn't something that works on demand. Have you ever been put on the spot and not known what to say? Imagine that moment being the deciding factor of whether or not you get paid that week. It's impressive to say the least that mangaka managed to keep a narrative thread going as long as they do. How do you plan ahead when 100% of your time is spent squeaking by at the last moment? It's hard. It's almost impossible. And the hardest thing to do when you have that much pressure on you is to make something creative, especially when that creation isn't exactly what you want to be doing. Togashi wanted to make manga. He wanted it to be his career. And sometimes to start a career, you have to do some work to establish yourself first. And while I don't feel like this impacted the vast majority of Yu Yu Hakusho, and while I do think that Togashi loved this manga and the characters within it, I am pretty convinced that this wasn't the manga that he wanted to be making at the time. And we'll see how this unmanageable lifestyle would wreck the end of the series and Togashi in a future video. And this is why I said in the beginning of the video that I've come to grow kind of attached to Yoshihiro Togashi. I feel a kinship with him, you know? What you're watching right now, Bonsai Pop, right? That's my Hunter Hunter. Treesicle was my Yu Yu Hakusho. It's where I went in head first and blew myself out. Just blew that tire, man. And it wasn't just me, it was all of us. It was Grant, Ryan, Tyler. We all just went too hard. But you learn your lessons. Tagashi is a different man now. He approaches creation differently and he does it healthily. I mean, as much as he can, considering, you know, what happened to him physically during this process. But that's all thanks to the lessons he learned with his first manga, with his first step into the entertainment industry. I get his pain and I feel that growth as a creator. And even if it's different mediums, I think the grind connects us all. Like I said before, work is work and work sucks, but we're all working towards something. We're out here together, grinding it out day to day, just trying to survive. And hey, maybe nobody's giving you this, but I'm proud of you. You're doing your best, even if it doesn't feel like you are. Keep killing it out there. We're gonna do our best, and you're gonna see the next video in this series very soon. That's a promise. That means we're gonna be talking about the Dark Tournament in all its glory. Thank you all for being patient with me, and I hope that you enjoyed this extended revamp of the beginning of Yu Yu Hakusho. My name's Mike, this is Bonsai Pop. You guys are rock stars, and I'll see you very soon.